to invite a divine spirit, a divine soul, who when I met her, we seemed to have just clicked immediately. And so it is my deep honor and pleasure to invite practitioner Miss Carol Campbell to deliver the, uh, the message, the talk. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Vance, for setting the tone for this morning. And let me add my own words of welcome to everyone here and to everyone who's listening to us on the internet. This is a beautiful day at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living here in warm, sunny Jamaica. And in case you came in after our opening song, we sang, look straight ahead. There's nothing but blue skies. It's a bright, sunshining day. And it really is, wherever you are. In the King James Version of the Bible, in Luke chapter 11, verse 33 to 36, we read, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick that they which come in will see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy whole body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If the whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. That's the end of that scripture. What is this light that is referred to in the Bible? It is wisdom, understanding, conscious awareness. That awareness that determines what we see in the physical world around us and how much we perceive of the intuitive world within us. It all boils down to knowing, not hoping, but knowing beyond doubt or reason that God is consciousness taking form. If the whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. Because we're dealing with individualized consciousness, yours and mine, each person reveals as much of God as their understanding permits. So I've titled my presentation this morning, Finding the Light. To simply say I am conscious of God in me, as me, is pointless if our experiences and attitudes belie this declaration. The truth is we do express God, commensurate with our own understanding of God. Our entire life experience is a reflection of our inner light or consciousness. And that sometimes can be a bit of a pill to swallow. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 23, we read, If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What does he mean? My interpretation, until and unless we begin to understand that the life of man is God, and that means our life, we will be seeing through a glass darkly, and our concept of life will be limited to the human conditions that confront us. The dark clouds which descend from time to time cannot be allowed to blur our vision. If, our, if in our darkness we believe that life happens to us rather than through us, our experiences will be fraught with endless demonstrations of fear, danger, conflict, discouragement, disappointment, pain of one sort or another, because that belief system becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If, however, we open to the full understanding of mind, that is, our mind, as cause to our experiences, this new light can illumine every little crevice and banish the shadows of doubt and fear that are lurking there. 
Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of our great metaphysical teachers, said it this way, our firm belief in any principle will lead to the demonstration of the power in that principle, end quote. When we become aware and understand the principle of causation as an inside job, a light bulb comes on, and being a victim is no longer an option. That's when we let go of fear and grab hold of faith, knowing that all that God is, is already in us, ready and waiting to be activated by our enlightened consciousness. There is a mighty moving power for good in the universe. It is resident in man. It is part and parcel of who we are. Think about it. If we could acknowledge ourselves as unlimited beings with infinite potential, where would our excuses go? Who could we blame for our apparent misfortunes? No one. Irvin Seal, in his book, Learn to Live, states, and I quote, it is the light of the mind which determines whether you see confusion and limitation or whether you see order and abundance. If through the light of your own mind you can see possibilities beyond the present conditions and facts, don't let the present conditions and facts dismay you or inhibit the movement of affirmative thought through you. Don't let them put a damper on your spirits. Don't let them cover up your true understanding of the mighty power of God in man. I'd like to read you a short excerpt from Khalil Gibran's book, Secrets of the Heart. The story is called The Tempest. And what I'm reading is a conversation between Yusuf, a recluse, and the protagonist, a young lad who has sought refuge in Yusuf's home during a storm. They are discussing the meaning of life and consciousness. Yusuf is speaking. Among all vanities of life, there is only one thing that the spirit loves and craves. One thing, dazzling and alone. What is it, I inquired with quivering voice. He looked at me for a long minute and then closed his eyes. He placed his hand on his chest while his face brightened and with a serene and sincere voice he said, it is an awakening in the spirit. It is an awakening in the inner depths of the heart. It is an overwhelming and magnificent power that descends suddenly upon man's conscience and opens his eyes, whereupon he sees life amid a dizzying shower of brilliant music, surrounded by a circle of great light, with man standing as a pillar of beauty between earth and the firmament. It is a flame that suddenly rages within the spirit and sears and purifies the heart, ascending above the earth and hovering in the spacious sky. It is a kindness that envelops the individual's heart, whereby he would bewilder and disapprove all who opposed it and revolt against those who refuse to understand its great meaning. It is a secret hand which removed the veil from my eyes while I was a member of society amidst my family, my friends, and my countrymen. He suddenly became silent, as if remembering something he had seen long before, refusing to reveal it. He walked toward the door, looking at the depths of the darkness, as if preparing to address the tempest. But he spoke in a vibrating voice, saying, it is an awakening within the spirit, he who knows it is unable to reveal it by words, and he who knows it not will never think upon the compelling and beautiful mystery of existence. We are advised in the Bible, with all thy getting, get understanding, and also lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. But where do we get our understanding from? And what is it that we really understand? When I speak about consciousness, what do I mean? 
Well, simply put, consciousness is the sum total of our thoughts and ideas, which amounts to the state of our mind. Now, sad to say, what state our affairs are in speaks volumes about the state our mind is in. Fortunately, we can do something about it. What thoughts and ideas we accept and embody will take form in our experience, but we can choose. What influences our thoughts and ideas? I've decided on three main culprits. First, <laughs> opinions. You know those pesky little things that people love to throw at you? These are usually other people's opinions. Friends, family, teachers, ministers, books, the media. If you respect them, or if it's popular and that's important to you, you tend to accept those opinions. But do opinions change? Minutely. One man's meat is another man's poison. It's all about perspective and personal agendas. What is that to thee? Make up your own mind. Second, science. Now science plays a big role in what we accept. Certain conclusions are arrived at through experimentation, scientific data is collected, and then presented as facts. Has science ever been wrong? Certainly, because it's based on facts, and facts are not necessarily truth. Facts are flexible and changeable, and as knowledge increases, facts change. Otherwise, we would still think the world was flat and certain diseases are incurable not terribly reliable. Third, our own intuition. Strangely enough, that is a source we tend to trust the least, when it should probably be the one we trust the most. Is our intuition ever off the mark? I would venture to say no, never. How many times have you heard yourself say, I knew it, you know, I should have followed my mind. The mistake we make is not acting on our intuition because we don't trust it and we don't trust ourselves to know. But our intuition is what tells us that we know what we know when we know without rational reasoning or analysis. We just know without explanation. And this is a knowing that we feel in our gut. Ignoring this intuitive knowing which is the inner light, understanding, and wisdom equates to hiding your light under a bushel. In truth, consciousness is God. So everything that we are conscious of is some part of God, whether it is person, place, thing, or experience. This is so because God is all there is. God is one. Not singular or plural, but one. One infinite beingness. We access it through our conscious awareness. God, our universal mind, contains all knowledge. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of religious science, writing in the Science of Mind text, pages 44 and 45, says, and I quote, Universal mind is the potential ultimate of all things. To it, all things are possible. To us, as much as possible as we can conceive according to law. This is the universal law. Should all the wisdom of the universe be poured over us, we should yet receive only that which we are ready to understand. Each state of consciousness taps the same source, but has a different receptivity. Each receives what he asks for according to his ability to embody. The universe is infinite. The possibility of differentiating is limitless." End quote. It's a bit like our use of electricity, isn't it? We can plug many things into the power source, but not every appliance will use the same amount of electricity. So if God is consciousness, and God is in me, as me, then God is the consciousness of which I am aware, and therefore my life experiences are a reflection of my God, 
my awareness showing up through the depth of my own understanding. The only place this understanding can happen is in my own mind, since you can't think for me any more than I can think for you. The thinker is the experiencer. What we think, we become. Our thoughts and feelings, and in particular, our feelings, go before as precursors for our experiences. The fact that we have access to unlimited wisdom really is a so what if we don't know what to do with it. Because what's important is not how much we know, but how much we apply what we know. Anybody remember Rodney Dangerfield? This comedian from a few years ago. He had a joke he used to tell. He said, you know, I took out a membership at a gym six months ago because I wanted to lose weight and get in shape. Evidently, you have to go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not what you know that makes a difference. It's how much you apply what you know. You have to go there. Our Declaration of Principles states, and I quote, we believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. So we boldly say, God is love and I am that love in expression. But are we? We can love unconditionally, sure. But we have to be willing to embrace everyone as God also, despite appearances and personalities. Until we can honestly do that, we cannot claim to know God as love. We can claim to be a work in progress. We say God is peace. And yes, we are always at choice to dissolve conflict or to escalate it with angry words and hateful actions. Is that peaceful? God is wholeness and perfection. We believe that. But do we take care of our bodies with correct nourishment and adequate exercise and rest? Do we even recognize our bodies as spiritual? Think about it. Ye are the light of the world, was Jesus' announcement to his disciples. Now I'm saying to you, you are the light of the world. You are the candle lit from the eternal flame. You need to let your light shine. Stand up and be counted. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. I want you to say with me, I am a light in this world. I am a light in this world. And I shine so bright. And I shine so bright. To your neighbor say, you are a light in this world, and you shine so bright. You are a light in this world, and you shine so bright. We are a light in this world, and we shine so bright. And we shine so bright. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, we read, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. This is a new day. This is the first day of the dawning of a new awareness in us. It is good and very good. Namaste. Yeah.